example. How does a Scrum Master build and maintain a high performing Scrum team? Really, we need to look right at those very early days. What we're talking about is setting up a team for success. Yes, once we've got past the foundational stages, there's lots to do, but I think it's always worthwhile thinking about what matters, what is worth looking at on day one. And for me, there's quite a lot, so I'm going to keep it as short as I can while covering quite a lot of bases. We're going to want to talk about why this team exists, what's the purpose. Right, so hopefully you've got a product goal or a product vision or something like that, that we can tell the team, this is why this product matters. Okay. That's absolutely vital. We, we want to know why we've been brought together. It's a basis to create a team on, but also why do they have to get out of bed in the morning? What is it? What's going to make them motivated? We need to start with that. So I'll be honest, I want somebody very senior to come in and show that they care and they want to explain this. This is why we have brought you together. This is why we want to form a team or multiple teams. So that product goal or vision okay, with some quantifiable measures. How do we know we're going in the right direction towards that overall product, service, whatever it is? Okay. And then at a lower level, what's this team been brought together to do? So it may be part of a larger initiative, and that's great. We've got this overarching goal to aim for, but but why us? Why do we matter? How do we fit in? Okay. So what is our goal as part of this? And how do we know that we're tracking in the right direction? So again, we need a goal and some way of measuring progress towards that goal. Okay. It's all very important is you're starting off with the why. You know, why do we matter? Why should we turn up to work and do our best? And once you've got that in place and people can see this is what we need to do, this is why it matters, and this is how we will know whether or not we're progressing in the right direction, we can move on to other more logistical things. So we're going to talk about who's in the team. You know, and by this, I genuinely mean who's actually in the team, not the people who say they are, but they don't actually do any work, but they always want to say who's in the team. Who's the core and who are people that we need to keep informed or we need to be aware of? They're not members of the team, but they may be important to this initiative. Okay. How do we work together? What's our working practices, our working agreement, the team norms? Okay. What's a good citizen in this team look like? Is a very, very important part of the conversation. How do we want to work together? What do we value being an extension of that conversation? So, you know. Maybe we, we value our family, we value um, our home life, and so we will finish on time. Great, that's a solid thing. We've set it up front, we're gonna put it on a wall maybe, or we're gonna make it invisible to everybody who works with us. If we're finishing at 5.30, we're finishing at 5.30. Obviously, we'll be practical about that, but don't turn up at 5.15 and expect us to stay until eight. It's not what we do. I actually quite like teams who draw those sorts of lines in the sands very early on. It sets their expectations on everybody. They know where they stand and actually it makes life easier, even if it's counter to the culture of the organisation. And I can't remember where I got this exercise from, but a great way of pulling it out is really asking them, what do they value and what are they willing to do to demonstrate that value? And, and often the harder one, what are they willing to give up? What are they willing to not do? To demonstrate that value. Go through each one. And as I said, we, we value friends, we value family, we value our home life. So we won't do overtime unless it's absolutely necessary. You know, we will respect people's time off and not message them unless it's absolutely necessary. And to be honest, that's a caveat that runs through all of it because I would love to say, you know, I can disappear completely, but if something goes wrong, maybe I'm the only person with the answer. And hopefully I'm a good enough team member to take the five minutes, but if it doesn't need me. Please don't contact me. It's kind of that thing. So we talked about the working agreements, the team values. One of the things I really like to make sure is in here is how do we make decisions? Is how do we decide when things are going wrong, when we're in conflict, when we just can't decide between two options because they're both good? How do we as a team decide? And we want to do this in the early days in what the Tuckman model would refer to as forming. Because what's coming, we all know, is storming, is conflict, is that time that gets a bit more turbulent. Okay. And 
that's too late to decide how to decide. We have to have already done it. So let's do it in those early days where people are being nice. They're trying to present the best selves first. Okay, how do we make decisions? And we're going to continue these conversations. We're going to build relationships. We're going to get people to know each other on a level, hopefully beyond that of a work colleague. It's great we can build effective teams between people who respect each other as work colleagues, but it's a nicer place to work and it is more powerful if they like each other. So we're going to spend time in amongst all these workshops. And of course, we're building backlogs and all these whys and wherefores to actually get to know each other. Take, take some time and just let your hair down if you've got some. Get to know each other on a more personal level. What do you like? Do you like football or rugby or do you like both? Do you like neither? You know, do you go for a beer or you prefer, you know, a glass of water? It doesn't matter. But in getting to know each other, you're actually going to help the team going forward. So we're going to be talking about getting everybody aligned, getting everybody on the same page as to who's in the team and how they work together, you know, what their values are, working agreements, all these things. And the final part is the context in which they're working. So things like that initial backlog, what are we expecting to work on? You know, what are any constraints by the organisation? Maybe we need to be aware of a budget. Maybe we need technological constraints placed on us. Maybe there's a time frame. I don't know. But at least let's be open and honest about it. Maybe it doesn't fit. Well, wouldn't it be useful to know that up front? And you can only know that if you put it into the room with the team and set them up. So this borrows heavily from a book by Ainsley Nice and Dinah Larson called Lift Off. I can't remember the tagline, but it's a great book um, that talks about agile chartering and chartering the teams in those early days. And what we want to do is precisely that is set them up for success. Take time in those early days, really get some of these conversations started. They're going to continue for as long as that team's together. You're going to be checking in. Do these still are working agreements? Do we want to update them? Do we want to change them? As new people come and go, we're going to continue to have that conversation. But without those, we're not going to end up with a high performing team. If you've got to this point in the video, I hope you've enjoyed it. If so, a like would be appreciated. If you want to hear more from me, more answers to questions that maybe you've got in the Agile world, please subscribe to the channel. And if you've got a question that you really want answered, drop it in the comments. I promise we'll get around to it. Thank you.